when you said, is he one of the last men to be hanged in Canada? I almost fell off my chair. The deal is no one's allowed to step in my body. Welcome to Seeing Dead People, the mystery storytelling podcast with a clairvoyant twist. Radio Sydney presents Seeing Dead People, Episode 13. Meet your hosts, Nicola and Darcy. Uh, I can't believe it, actually, Darcy. We have been seeing dead people together for over a year. That is amazing. I, I knew we started sometime around here, but I did not realize we were getting to that year part. Yep. We've done uh, 12 episodes, and since we're both regularly getting questions about the show and getting questions about our backgrounds, I think uh, it's been a good idea we've decided to dedicate this episode to talking to one another and getting to know one another a bit better. But before we get to our first questions, I thought I'd just refresh our memories a bit about what we've explored and experienced this year. So over the last 12 episodes, we've met a disturbing apparition on a Vancouver Island golf course, the roving and animated ghosts of three Canadian architectural gems, a teenage pair of murdered bobby soxers, the noisy spirits inhabiting Toronto's most haunted house, an unknown dead man on an Australian beach, the last two men to be hanged in Canada, and believe it or not, both Lizzie Borden and Jack the Ripper. What do you think of that? We've had quite the quite the year of um, experiences. It has been, and it is amazing how you've done the research and brought everything together, and allowing me to use my intuitive ability to have a look and put my perspective on it. I mean, this isn't something I would have thought to do myself. It's, it's kind of an interesting twist, isn't it, to, to pull our two talents together? Yeah, because um, when I first met you, uh, I think you mentioned that you're right. Is that correct? It is indeed. And would you mind sharing with the audience the type of writing you do? Not at all. And I think we, the audience should know that when you talk about meeting, the truth of it is we've only met once face to face. And we've really only met on the telephone uh, having doing our episodes. So we really haven't spent much time together. But yes, I've originally been uh, writing for quite some time and have published or had published a number of mystery novels and uh, women's fiction and a lot of short stories. And you know, just been doing the mystery novel writing scene for quite a number of years. What, what drove you to writing mystery? I think it's I've always interested in the unknown and unsolved mysteries, which of course led me to, you know, doing seeing dead people. But my father was a big mystery reader. We used to read the green penguin paperbacks and all my siblings are pretty well interested in reading and, and many of them like mysteries. And I thought after reading quite a lot of them that at uh, one point I thought I'd really like to be able to write one myself and ended up writing, I think uh, about a, uh, nearly a dozen, I think. So if someone wanted to actually find one of the books that you wrote? Is there a place they could go? Yeah, you can. Thanks for asking. Yes, my books are available on Amazon.ca and Amazon.com. Um, you can also get them as uh, in print and you can get them as ebooks. So that's it's nice to have them still available. That's excellent. So do you have a website for it too, where people could at least view some of the stuff like as a snippet? Well, I have of one. what you write? Sure, I have a, a basic website, just nicolafurlong.com, and it's just what they call, and your daughter would know, it's just a landing page where I have uh, information about a variety of things that I'm doing. So I mentioned seeing dead people, I mentioned the books, I mentioned the other radio show that I do, and from there you can jump off to the links that take you to the individual uh, areas where you can find out more about seeing dead people, more about my writing, more about other things that I've been doing, some of my art, that kind of stuff. Okay. Oh, yes, I did forget. You do artwork on top of it like Ashley does. <laughs> well, I've done some artwork um, for the last few years, but I've, I just kind of like the writing gig. And, and I don't know if you find that with the psychic gig, and I don't mean to say that in any negative way, but the writing gig and the art, art gig are really hard to market. You know, there's a lot of people out there with a lot of talent. There's a lot of people out there who 
think they're talented. And so there's a sort of a surfeit of stuff out there and you continually have to market it as the creator. And after a while, it just gets to be a bit of a drag and it's not nearly as much fun because you're spending more time trying to sell your work than you are creating your work. And, you know, you end up becoming a salesperson and generally people who I think who are writers and perhaps even uh, artists aren't necessarily the kind who want to go out and, you know, boast about themselves. So it's a very difficult task to take on. And after a while, it just becomes a bit of a drag. And I wonder how do you find that with the, the psychic world that you have to continually market yourself? Well, I think there's a slight advantage to my part because when I first started, it was literally word of mouth. And I did a few um, shows in person at what used to be chapters. Oh, yeah. And then I um, had approached a mutual friend, Bill, and we were hoping to do um, a psychic zone on the radio, but that didn't pan out, and I understand that's how you found me in the first place, through a mutual acquaintance of ours. Right. And um, I have a website, so people go to my website, uh, readingsbydarcy.com. Okay, Dan. And since my daughter actually has redone my website, it's like I barely talk to people now, except to do the reading. All I have to do is say, go here, and like the, that's basically how... Up until recently, people were actually finding me. Word of mouth or website. Well, that's gr- yeah. that's great. And, and it's nice that Ashley is so talented and able to help you out with the website. But it shows, I think, an indication of your abilities and what you deliver. Because word of mouth, you can't beat that as the best marketing possible. And you don't get word of mouth on a positive s- side unless you are actually providing a service that people really want and really like. And that is so true. And now besides doing seeing dead people, I have three live broadcasts, podcasts or broadcasts a week, um, doing Psychic Zone readings with myself and my sister Penelope, and then one out by myself. Oh, so I do more. Because on Sunday, I do a pre-recorded show that I put out for a generic look at the week ahead. So I'm now on YouTube and Facebook. Oh, wow. So I have to admit, I not looked you up there. So how would I find you on those two sites? Um, if you have a YouTube account, you would just look for Intuitive Readings by Darcy. And Facebook is a reading dash by Darcy. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. It actually, it has an, and you're, you're the reason I actually have a live broadcast. I am? You are, because after doing the first show with Seeing Dead People, I turned to my daughter and I said, why can't I do this? <laughs> and the next, next thing you know, I was just doing it live on Facebook, and then I got brave, started to post to YouTube, and in actual fact, July 9th is my first anniversary date. You're kidding. So you, you're one year into your own gig doing readings through the internet. Yes, and all because of you. <laughs> well, that's great, Darcy. I'm really pleased. So let's let's explore a little bit more about your psychic abilities because I'm always so fascinated by them and I, I still find it amazing that you have them. How long would you say you've been professionally providing psychic services? I have professionally been providing services since 1999. Okay, I wow. took a little break for a while because... I also work full-time, and it just got to be too much. So for about the last three, four years, well, probably a little longer, five years, I, you know, I dabbled here and there, but I decided that this is a joy for me. I love doing readings. Oh, cool. Uh, It's fun. And I get to, even if I don't meet people in person now because of COVID, I've totally gone online, phone. Uh, FaceTime, doing readings, I'm still meeting really interesting people. I bet. And I feel that if I can give something to someone to give them an idea or choice of where their future is going, or today, like um, the lady I read for today, her dad and her grandma and her aunt all came forward. And she got to make that connection once again and understand just how much even 
of their past, they are there, they're loving her and, you know, trying to help her find her way. Well, cool. And you said something really interesting there. You said they came forward. Now, when, when we work through our seeing dead people, our our stick is to have a storyline prepared and then photographs. And somehow by looking at photographs and listening to my reading the storyline, you're able to connect with these individuals. When you're doing your own psychic readings, then how are you getting in touch with the other side? Well, I have my own guides. We all have guides. You have guides like your dad. Okay. I have guides. And what happens is that they'll come forward and they'll start talking. And a lot of times they'll either do a description of themselves, you know, 5'10", 160 pounds, gray hair, likes to smoke sort of idea. <laughs> or they'll give me their first or middle name. Because, and I, it's easy to believe this, but I remember, oh, God, it's got to be 10 years ago, I had a lady on the phone, we're doing a phone reading, talking to her, and she says, did you look me up? And I went, excuse me? She goes, did you Google me? And I went, why would I do that? And she says, well, because you know too much. And she went, I don't have the time to Google you, lady. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, from that point on, I said to her, give me something I don't know. You know, a middle name, a nickname, uh, a favorite dog or cat, something that will connect to the people. Now, Spirit has done that numerous times for me, and I'll still have people say, well, no, it's not him. And then when I'm done reading, they go, oh, wait a minute, that was my dad's middle name. Really? It, yes. So, you know, uh, I'm never too sure how Spirit's going to come forward. Well, are you then seeing and hearing and feeling something when you're trying to communicate with these people? All of that. I feel, I hear, I smell, I taste. Um, I'll get emotional sometimes, especially if it's a young person. Yeah. And I'll start crying with them. Wow. And are you hearing them, in, would you say, at least what you think, are you hearing them in their voice, in their words? Absolutely. There must be some people who communicate to you more readily, more easily, more clearly. There are. Um, sometimes talking to spirit is like pulling teeth. And there will be moments where I'm talking to, say, the mother of the family in spirit, knowing the husband's dead, but he won't say anything. He'll talk to her, and then she has to tell me. And it's like, well, could you just talk out loud? Um, and it, it, to, to be able to see them speak is different because while we're speaking, you can hear the words being formed. And if I mispronounce something, you can sort of pretty well guess what I'm trying to say. Uh, with spirit, sometimes their mouth doesn't move. And sometimes it's cue cards, especially if they have a foreign language. Oh, yeah. You mentioned that in one of our shows that if uh, you need to have uh, understand a foreign language, they will give you a cue card of information. Um, or they'll show me something like ducks lined up in a row, which means that they give me three ducks, that means they have three children. Okay. Yeah. Well, when something like, like when you're going through this regularly, you're connecting with, as you say, not only the people that you're just talking to on the phone, obviously, but the people that you're connecting to in the spirit world. Do you find yourself overwhelmed by all the voices? Oh. Uh, I'll say the, when I first started, yes, because I didn't know how to shut off particular voices. Okay. But as I have progressed, one, I know how to shut the voices off so I can live a daily life. But I also have learned how to fine tune. Like if I have three people talking to me at once in spirit form, I can actually narrow in on the person I want. And it's like... Yeah, I guess it is like mind over matter is what I'm hearing a guy say to me right now. And it's like that because I have to mentally ask the other two to be calm for a minute to let me hear the one voice because the one voice is the voice people want to hear. Okay, now you're doing all of this silently in your head. Yes, oh, but there are times when I'm driving that I'm answering questions as I drive to 
people who are sitting in the back seat or beside me talking to me. Okay, well, explain this a little bit more. You're driving in the car, and you have literally there's nobody else in the car with you. Truthfully, right? There's no human person who's alive in the car with you? Yep. Okay. No human person. And what I really like is, you know, when you pull up to the ferry and they can see there's one person in the car, right? Yeah. They can see that it's just you and they go, anyone else in the car? And I look around and I go, do dead people count? <laughs> have you actually said that to someone at the ferry? I, I have. What is their reaction? She goes, no, the one girl with out a dad of an eye, no, nope, no, nope, we don't charge for them. <laughs> Way to go, Darcy. That's good. So are these people just deciding to drop in and visit you, or are you, have you focused while you're driving to zero in on them? You know, sometimes I'll pass the site where someone has died. Ooh. You know, like if they've been hit on the side of the road, and they pop in because they've seen the light, so to speak. And they go, hey, can you do this for me? And now I used to track people down and give messages, but I don't do that anymore because... Not everyone is open to messages from deceased loved ones. No, I bet you they aren't. And that would be, you know, you're causing more strife for yourself than you are benefiting them. Yes. But having said that, in 1992, we were in Scotland and there was um, a a TV program on. And there was a show of a lady. It was on the news about a lady who got hit with a tree and died. Oh, and I looked at it, and I went, oh, my God, I'm going to meet her husband. And four years later, I met her husband. Now, And I did, didn't know him at first. Okay. Okay. So he was, I was at a house party with a group of friends, and I saw this picture of a lady, and the picture literally flew across the room at me. And I picked it up and looked, and I went, oh, my God. And I thought, how do I tell a perfect stranger that his wife would like to say hello to him? I, I grabbed the bull by the horns, and he, he happened to come in as I'm looking at the picture. He goes, oh, that's my wife. I went, yeah. I said, I know. He goes, how come you have her across the room? I said, a little story to that. And so I explained the whole story from first seeing the program to the picture flying at me and what I saw. And he just said thank you. He never got a chance to say goodbye to her. That, that's amazing. So two things. When you first were in Scotland and heard, her on, heard about it on the television, it popped into your head that you were going to go, that you were going to meet her husband, like just the, the words, I'm going to meet the husband, or you're going to meet my husband, I'm, or what? How did that come out? Nope. It was literally my aunt was sitting there. She was listening to it, and I went, I'm going to meet her husband. Okay, but how did you and get that? Because it was there. It was in my, I guess, in my head and out of my mouth, just like that. Wow. And then when you later, years later, ran into this, the husband, did you actually say the picture flew? Oh, yes. I did. I Pi- said the picture flew across the room. And he went, yeah, that's about what she'd do. <laughs> so he, he was open to it. Oh, that's good. But, you know. I didn't know that. No. So you must get yourself into trouble sometimes. Oh, yes, I do. (laughs) I'm learning. I think that's why I, like, COVID's been great. I've always sort of, since I really um, have gone into embracing the intuitive side of myself, I have sort of self-isolated. Unless I actually know you, I'm... I try to keep the information to myself. I have a girlfriend, Marion, who I drove by her house one day and I phoned her. And I said, hey, why do you have the blue tarp on your roof? And she goes, I don't have a blue tarp on my roof. I went, really? And she called me the next day and she says, I have a blue tarp on my roof. And I said, just one? What about the second one? She called me the next day and said, she called me a very colorful word that rhymes with witch. <laughs> I said, it's not my fault. Um, a tree fell on the roof, and then the next day another tree fell on the roof. <laughs> oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so I, I, I don't mind to family and friends. Like, I'll get these feelings of um, oppression or dread, and so I start phoning all my family and my friends saying, okay, what's going on? Who's sick? 
And everyone keeps going, no, but, of course, the next day, I get the message that someone had a heart attack, someone died, someone had a car accident. Right. So then then how do you feel at that point? Because you've, you've tried to uh, follow up on your intuition and you weren't able to, and still the, you know, the unfortunate occurrence happened. How do you feel the next day? Do you feel just frustrated or what? Um, actually, I'm not bad the next day because it just shows that I did feel something. And by maybe reaching out, uh, people will be open to the next time I do that. Yeah, that's hard. So I've learned not to beat myself up about it. Well, that's good, because I'm sure that's a hard lesson to take. Can be. Sometimes the messages are pinpoint clear. Other times it's just a little hazy and you're not too sure which way to go with it. And you've, over the years, just had to kind of learn to adapt to that. I have. Well, I want to ask you, when a year ago, a little more than a year ago, I guess, before we had our first call, the idea that um, Bill, our mutual friend with Radio Sydney, uh, suggested that I talk to you about working together on a show. What was your initial reaction when you first heard about that? Oh, well, I think my first initial reaction was, really, I want to talk to more dead people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, now I realize you've got them all the time. Yeah, that's a good good point, Darcy. <laughs> and then I thought, in all honesty, I did not know your take on right. people being intuitive. Yep. You know, like, you could be doing it um, in such a way that, you know, you're making me have egg on my face. Right. But the more I got to know you, the more I think you're really interested in it because there's such a different way of looking at life now. Yep. And not just life, but life after you die. And, and the energy you leave behind. Yeah, that's so cool. So, and I have to say, at first I was a little hesitant, but as the shows have progressed, and I love the topics that you pick, <laughs> there's been nothing I would have looked at. Now, I have to say, Jack the Ripper, I was a little hesitant doing him. Oh, yeah, why? I was, oh, I was afraid he was going to stick around afterwards. Well, you know, I wanted to say to you, we didn't actually get a chance because the show ran, it was such a good show. and We talked about so many things re regarding, of course, all the women and all the other possible suspects. We didn't really get to talk about Jack himself. And I was thinking afterwards, he was quite a nasty guy, obviously. And you were left with him sort of hanging. Yeah. And, you know, like, I've seen evil in my lifetime. And he was something like the energy off of him. Even my daughter didn't want to be in the same house with him. Wow. So it took a little work to move him forward, but fortunately I've got my, my dad, my uncle on the other side, and they're brutes. So they took care of him for me. That's a really, um, well, for me it's a shocking statement, Darcy, that you would be experiencing something so bad like that because I decided I wanted to see what you could do with Jack the Ripper. So I kind of feel quite sorry and badly that I I realize I'm putting you into situations you know nothing about them until we start talking. And eventually you'll twig, or not even eventually, quite quickly you'll twig to what we're talking about. And I never know how you do that. But you're always going into our discussions completely blind. I, of course, have all the information and nothing from the other side, but I know what I'm going to be talking about. And so for me, it's not a, a shock, but I realize it must be sometimes quite disturbing for you. Well, I have to say that when his picture came up, I thought I was going to fall off my chair. Really? I did. And I mean, the other ones have been really interesting and, um, you know, a little, they've been a little disturbing, but nothing like Jack the Ripper. Uh, he was probably the most, I know it sounds crazy, but most intriguing one to do. Okay, next to Lizzie Borden. Those two probably were my top favorites. Oh, were really? they? Yeah. Even though Jack was so disturbing, in the end, I mean, when did you start feeling disturbed? We had a long, as I said, we had a long, it was a fascinating discussion about the women 
their deaths, sadly, a little bit about their backgrounds, and then a discussion about, you know, the times. And when did you start feeling that sort of dread then about Jack himself? Only when you saw that actual photograph? No. I think because you lead into the story, you tell a little blurb about the actual story, and then the first picture... I was beginning to get the hairs up the back of my neck. Uh-huh. Um, and then as we progressed into it, I was being nauseous, and I thought, oh, my God, I know who this is. Oh, yeah. You poor thing. See, I, I feel so bad because here I am on the other end. You know, I'm just relishing the fact that I get to read this story to you and talk about it with you and see what your reaction is. I admit, I'm not really being empathetic enough to think what it's doing to you. Oh, yes, but see, if I was any other person, it probably would um, put a little hinge on my personality. But because I've dealt with the experience of the two people all my life, it's like water on a duck. Once I realize where I am and I put a protective shield around myself, I'm perfectly fine. It still doesn't mean it doesn't give me the heebie-jeebies. Right. Okay. But sometimes it's rather intriguing to be on this side and looking at it and going, oh, my God, like I said, who they thought he was and who he was are two different people. Yeah, exactly. A, a, a huge difference. The one that really haunts me, if I can say that, because they all haunt me. I think they were. I think every episode has been so interesting, and you've received some amazing insights every bloom in time but the ones that really resonated with me although I admit the last two Lizzie Borden and Jack the Ripper they were really fantastic I really thought they just sang but the ones that earlier ones that really sang to me were the the two fellows in the Dawn jail and the courthouse yeah like Arthur Lucas you know the last man to be hanged in Canada and when you said is he one of the last men to be hanged in Canada? I, I almost fell off my chair. Well, it was interesting because the way they showed it was they showed a noose and then they cut the noose. And I thought, well, that means he's got it. That must be the last one because for a cut noose, uh, how else would they make a new one? And so, I didn't see a new one after it. It's interesting that you're able to interpret like you're brilliant in that you're able to interpret those sort of images that you're getting oh sometimes i am and sometimes it's like i've got to talk it out so that i can actually see it it's like getting the uh five ducks in a row okay like three of those would be children um husband and wife but if they only give me a one major duck and three little ones which one of these ducks are dead Ah, okay, so there's a missing parent, you think, but you don't know which if it's yeah. the mother or the father. That's right. And they'd have to turn the duck a little so I could tell. If she <laughs> came at me like she is right now in my head, with her arms, her wings sprayed, and she's quacking at me, then that means the father's dead, because a mother duck will attack. What would the father duck do if the mother were dead? The father duck would probably wink at me. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow, that's cool. So what, what led you to even wanting to do this type of show? Like, there had to be some intrigue for you to want to bring these types of shows forward. Well, I appreciate you asking the question. Yeah, I, as I said earlier, I've always liked mysteries. And I used to watch any kind of television show, read any kind of book about unsolved mysteries, whether it's the Loch Ness Monster, you know, whom I, I wish and hope is still there, to scary stories like Jack the Ripper. Uh, I've always been fascinated by them. And so writing mystery novels myself was one fun way, but they weren't, you know, I, I didn't like, like to write slasher books, so they're not horrific. But I do have a intrigue and interest in the the supernatural and the paranormal. And when I was working with Radio Sydney for the first time, and I do a program with them as well called About the Peninsula, which is a, a fun conversational interview program with, with folks on the Saanich Peninsula that I find interesting. 
just chatting about their lives. And the radio station manager, Bill, had asked, have you any other ideas for any other shows? Because, you know, we need content. It's a volunteer radio station and there's a bunch of people providing music, but not too many people are providing the, you know, spoken word. And I thought about it for quite a while before I responded because already it takes a fair amount of time to do about the peninsula. It's every two weeks. And then I thought, you know, if I was going to do something, I wanted it to be something to do with the supernatural. And I just thought, that's what I'm going to say to him. And he's going to laugh at me and then I won't have to do it because he'll just say, that's a dumb idea. We don't want that. So I was fairly confident in my response, talking to him and saying, you know, I've thought about this seriously and it will take a lot of time. I know and I'm already taking a lot of time. And the only thing I'd do is a supernatural show. And you, as you have met Bill, he's a really enthusiastic, gregarious guy. And his response was just so typical, Bill. He said, oh, that's just a great idea. And do you know Darcy? She's a, she's our psychic. And I just, like, boom, boom. It went from my idea of a supernatural show to a, a duo, a, a, a show with two people talking about the supernatural and one person, you, having a real talent in it. And that just, it just exploded. And then my head just went, wow, I can just see so many opportunities to tell stories, which of course is what I like to do and explore the supernatural. And then to find out with someone like you, what your life's like, what you know about these stories, what you can tell us. And then, you know, when we were able to discuss our first ideas, I didn't know how you worked, literally, how does, how your spirit guide helps you, how you find out what people are saying. I mean, I had no idea about you. And I have to admit, at the beginning, I before we talked, I was a little skeptical, just the way you were for me. I was wondering, you know, is this an individual a bit on the quirky side or kooky side? And of course, you're not kooky at all. You're fun and quirky, though. And when we started to talk and we began, began to realize that you can get information from photographs that was just like wow boom a real light bulb went off and that's something I think that adds such a neat twist to our show if I can find photographs you can get so much from the photographs and the listeners of course can see the photographs and get it too so it really works well it's not just a spoken word well then that brings me to with Jack the Ripper yeah of course, most of the shows we did with the woman who hunts the link, um, Cold King Haunted Castle. Yep. And Jack the Ripper, and I think the Eerie Phoenix on Bond Street. Yep. But each one of them, I believe, I saw a picture that it showed extra, like um, a name, a person in the window. But when you looked at them, you couldn't see them. But since we've talked about them, have you been able to go back and look at these and, and say, oh, yeah, there it is. Like in the angel on the wall above the door where I said I didn't believe that was one of Jack Ripper's victims. Right. The second last of his victims. Yeah. So were you able to actually see the angel on the wall? No. But I could, I could see something. I could kind of start to... I was trying to open myself up to it and I could see that the wall, you know, wasn't a solid wall. It had some kind of coloration or discoloration. And I think if I were able to open myself up more, I might've been able to see them, but I can't see the way you can at all. But when you do say, for example, and you've said a few times, oh, there's a woman in the window or there's someone on the corner or someone walking by, I try very hard to see, but I have to admit, I don't see. Well, that, that could come with time. Yep. Okay. I believe we're all intuitive. It's just a matter of opening a door a little bit more. And for some people, it can be terrifying well, to open that door. I would think so, because when I think about, you know, you're, what you were talking about when you felt uh, your, your, your gut reaction to uh, seeing and experiencing, literally experiencing Jack the Ripper, I can see that would be terrifying. Like, for me, I'm just... It's like I'm inside a glass bubble, right? I, I can hear you talk and I can imagine what you might be going through and I can, I can sympathize, but I can't empathize. I can't feel what you feel. I don't get the gut. I, my gut doesn't get scared. I don't get that kind of reaction. But what I do get, though, I definitely do get the shivers up the spine because I can just hear how you're nailing it, how you've got to be in communication with somebody because... 
you wouldn't know any of this stuff. You've been told none of it. So how else would you know this without actually being able to have some sort of communication beyond an area that I, I can't even imagine? Well, and you, taking that a little farther, do you want to explain to people why I don't know anything before we actually do the show? Well, the fundamental thing is I tell you nothing. I put you completely in the dark all the time. I spend the time creating the show. I pick the topic. You have no idea about the topic. And sometimes it's quite a challenge to pick the topic because I want one that's, it has to be historical because I'm trying to find photographs that I can take advantage of. And historical mysteries are always, in some ways, can be more, more interesting. And I need something that, that has photography out there that's available. So it can't be, you know, there's some great stories from the 15th century. But really, I don't know how you're going to get anything other than my words, because there'll be no photographs to talk to you about some, you know, horrific uh, Salem witches trial, for example. That would be a fun thing to go through with you. But we have no photographic evidence, so it doesn't really suit our layout, our format for the show. So while the show is running on Radio Sydney, our, our current show, I'm digging around for that month trying to come up with a storyline, the one that has photographs that I find is fascinating, that I really dig because I want to know more about it. And it's complicated, not just a simple, you know, one individual involved. And so to get that kind of story is a bit of a challenge. And all this time, you're completely blissfully ignorant. You're ignorant of everything until you see the photographs when you open them up and we start talking about the show and you only open up the photographs in the order I ask you to open them up. So I'm very cagey about showing you who we're talking about. You're always finding out the name from my perspective. I'm going to give you the photograph of the main character later in the list of photographs. So it's taking you 15, 20, 30 minutes, if not longer, before I'm going to reveal we're talking about Lizzie Borden. But bummer, you're always catching me off guard and knowing within 10 or 15 minutes, if not sooner, we're talking about Lizzie Borden. Well, and speaking of Lizzie Borden, yeah. after the show was done, how did you feel when I told you it wasn't Lizzie, but very likely her sister? You know, I loved that idea, and I really wished... And I have thought about it, and if I ever get the time, I'd like to go back and dig and see what if there was a possibility that her being out of town wasn't uh, as thoroughly researched or she could have possibly come back. Because I, I like that, your storyline. It made a lot of sense to me that she would be involved. I still say I think Lizzie was involved. I kind of thought my idea was fun, the the, uh, the affair between the two women, but that's because I thought it was kind of fun, not necessarily that it was legitimate. But when I look at the picture of Emma, and I'm working now when I, you know, talking to you, I try to get uh, more open to looking at faces and seeing what they're telling me. And I thought she was a much more cold, calculating person than Lizzie was. Absolutely. And uh, after the show, I think I spent two days talking to Spirit asking them, is there a possibility of this? And it took two days to get an answer that, yeah, you, you're on the right track. You just needed to go farther. And I thought, okay, so who could be connected to Emma that may have helped out? Yeah. You know, because with the trauma that Lizzie experienced, I'm certain her sister experienced it as well. Yes. So there were some old grudges, and the fact that they were being sold off to be married, that was a big thing, too. And that's for sure, so, and that was, a, from my perspective, that was an unknown thing, because I didn't find that in my research. Now, I haven't spent, you know, the time to research this, this story comprehensively, but I did a fair amount of research, and nowhere was that mentioned. So, And I think it makes a good amount of sense, Darcy, like it was a very good, insightful comment, because it's the logical thing that would have happened in those days. Yes. And given how mean her father, their father was, yeah. you know, I could imagine he wouldn't have sold them to nice people. No, I'm sure there would have been some business arrangement. That would be the only yeah. thing that mattered. Well, to her dad, that would have been it, yeah. Well, let me ask you then. You call me once a month and we have this discussion. What are you thinking when you make that phone call? Are you a complete blank slate? How are you feeling going into every episode? Well... I do try to be a blank slate. Normally, I'm either finishing up a reading, and then so I'm jumping from one live, this lively discussion to the future for someone, but I'm jumping into literally the past. Yep. And 
I do it like that sometimes because it, I'm so open to suggestion now that when I jump, not only do I have extra people helping me, but I'm also open to anyone who really wants to come forward from that time frame. So for you then, you approach it, it's a positive hour. It's not a drudge for you. You don't dread it. You're not worried about it. Nope, because I always know that I have people on my side that will close down the door for me, nail it shut, and I never have to address it again unless I want to. And it, for me, it's intriguing. Like, I, I actually wanted to grow up and be a police officer. Oh, really? And Yes. I, well, a teacher or a police officer. And when I took my first law class, my degree is in criminology. Uh-huh, yep. And I'm very, in life, I'm very analytical when I look at things. But then I have this so unanalytical side of me that it's like, this just allows, it nurtures it. That's how I look at it. When I do readings and when I do this show, I nurture my very soul because I'm getting to look at, at things and I don't really have to worry about what I'm saying. Like, I don't have to mark my words carefully when I'm doing the show. Right. Because we're looking for what are they saying? Like, what is their impression? And so when I'm looking to the past to see, okay, what happened to this person, I'm relying on them totally to give me the right information. Okay, so you truly believe you're a conduit. Yes. Trying not to put your uh, ideas, your shading on the words that are coming out of your mouth. Yes. And when I, if I do, I actually, if you'll notice, I'll say, well, this is how I'm feeling. Yeah. But when it's them, I'm talking like them. The deal is no one's allowed to step in my body. Pictures, they're allowed to talk to me, give me smells, uh, let me taste things. But spirit is not allowed in my body. And, and that is simply because I like to be in control. Well, shoot, I should and, hope so. <laughs> and if they're in my body, I'm not in control. So could you allow a spirit to take over your body? Uh, nope. I mean, is it physically no. possible? Not that you'd want to, but are you at I, risk of doing that sometime? I probably could do it sometime. But I need to know that I have someone here who can pull me out of hat. This happened once in my lifetime. Um, I had two spirits take over, but my aunt, and this is way before I really got into paying attention to my intuitive ability. And when it happened, my aunt on my dad's side happened to be there. And she literally took my hands and said, listen to me. And she walked me through the process of coming back into my own body. Because I actually got pushed out of my body. I was standing there and she saw what happened and she brought me back into my body. So without someone who knows the actual details of how how to do it, I won't allow possession. Wow. Okay, I need to understand that a bit more. When you say your aunt helped you back into your body, was your aunt alive and in the room? Yes. Oh, okay, cool. Um, My aunt, uh, there were... Four of us in the room, my aunt, my cousin, my ex-sister-in-law, well, sister-in-law at the time, and then my other cousin when it happened. And it was the weirdest feeling because I'm standing outside looking in. My sister-in-law put her hand on my shoulder, and I literally watched her hand go through my body. And she told me years later, she would never admit to it at the time, but years later, just before her brother and I broke up, she said to her, I need to tell you something. This has been bothering me ever since it happened. And she's the one who confirmed that her hand went through my body. Oh, my God. Yeah, then my aunt just took my hand and talked me back. And to this day, I could not tell you what she said. Uh Uh-huh. All I can do is feel it. And it was like literally a suction cup. And when I hear a suction cup, go off, I'm looking around to see what's happening. <laughs> well, where did the spirit come from that took you over? Uh, it was in my aunt's house. Um, oh. They were, two of her her um, loved ones had passed, her, her husband and one of her sons. Uh-huh. And 
my aunt uh, did playing cards and tarot cards, but she didn't use the mediumship portion, or I don't know if she ever used it, to be honest. And so at that point, I didn't know I was a medium. I didn't know I could channel. And at that, after that, it was like there's no further way anyone's walking into my body. They have tried, wow. but they get pushed out right away. That must have been awful. Uh, as a 19-year-old, yeah, it was. Wow, 19. Because when people talk about, you know, you talk about people who are dying and they see themselves they have the out-of-body experience that's the classic terminology and they're floating above their body would you say that's what you were experiencing except i wasn't floating i was just standing behind the chair and it's like what the and i had no idea what happened i could see myself and i could see myself in the reflection of the oven i could see my mouth moving and talking to my aunt and then the next thing i'm back wow how did you cope with that psychologically? Oh, I didn't sleep that night, and my cousin gave me quite a bit of wine that night to sleep, <laughs> but I never did go to sleep because the whole house knows on me. It took me a couple of days to come back to understanding the difference between being a psycho and a psychic. Uh, <laughs> well, then, do you have all your life that are you always kind of having to protect yourself? Are you always kind of having to be wary? Absolutely. Everyone I need in life I have to be careful of because I don't know who's attached to them. Situations of going into places and going, oh my God, I've been here, what happened? And, and not really wanting to look, but all of a sudden there's a flash and you get the picture. So yeah, it's always been a case of, especially when I started to embrace my gift. Yep. I would say more so then, learning how to treat it like a light switch. So literally to shut the voices off, I see a light switch. You've learned how to do that? Yeah. So how did you just, what, started to practice that yourself, knowing that you had to have some way to get this stuff to stop? Yes. Um, I was trying to figure out, how do you turn something off? Right. And I was standing at the light one day and I turned it off and I went, oh my God, it's like a light switch. So I started practicing and for the longest time I actually physically had to stand next to a light switch and go, I'm turning you off and turn off the light switch. Wow. Now it's just automatic. Yeah. So would you say then is your start of every day and the way you function every day, are you functioning with the light off and you turn it on when you want to rather than having it on all the time? I would like to say yes to that, but some, when you go to sleep, um, you don't always have control over what's happening in your sleep. Right. And so there's a lot of time I'm talking to deceased to loved ones who are coming back to Earth, and they want to know where they're going. In life, I wake up with, I think it's the first five minutes that when after I wake up, it's like, okay, that's it. I don't want to hear anyone, and I shut the light switch off. But then have you had a restful sleep? Oh, I doubt it very much. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are times that I, I think I'm asleep, but I wake up in the morning and I'm just dead to the world. But a lot of times I go to bed and I ask for protection and guidance and I ask them to shut the switch off so I can sleep. So I know we're, we're coming to the end of our hour and I want to ask you, so is this, for your from your perspective, you say it's a joy to participate, but is it also a, a fair burden? When I first started, I could honestly say yes, it was a burden. The idea of connecting to deceased loved ones, of giving people messages of possibilities of their future, and now it's like a calling. You know, you hear people saying they get called to be a, a minister or a nun or a police officer. This is a calling because if I didn't have the grace of God on my side to help me do it, I wouldn't do it. So it's no longer a burden. Sometimes it's frustrating. Yep. But it's not a burden because I'm giving back people the closure that they needed in the first place. The ability to let go of anger, frustration, to embrace joy. And so for me, I feel I'm doing the right thing.
And I have always said, if I ever wake up one day and I don't hear God telling me, it's okay, you go ahead and do this, I'll quit. I wait to hear him tell me it's time to shut it down, and he hasn't yet. Okay, I'm threatened, but <laughs> he hasn't yet. He keeps it coming, and I keep delivering. So you you have a spiritual link not only to the, let's say, the other side, but you have a spiritual link to the supreme being. Well, let's call him universe. Okay. Because, you know, everyone's definition of God is different. Right. I believe all men are equal. Not all men believe they're equal. So I have a connection to universe. And if universe is your God, then so be it. If he's my God, then I work with him. But I feel that universe is saying to me, this is something you need to do. And I do honestly believe that most mediums, psychics, who really believe in this spiritual connection are doing it because they've been asked to. Wow. I still say it's, it must be heavy to carry. Um, I guess to say, actually, the only time I really find it and get really heavy is when I'm dealing with a child that has passed, whether it's naturally or due to some sort of criminal activity. That is when I find it the heaviest. Yeah, that must be very difficult. But everyday life, you know, we're born, we live, we die. And some people never get an opportunity to say goodbye. I mean, I was fortunate when my dad died. He showed up and sat at the foot of my bed. And at first I was confused because he could stand and walk. Okay? And it's like, you can't be my dad, and I'm sleeping, really, I'm sleeping. Mm -hmm. I was awake talking. And the reason I say he couldn't have been my dad is because my dad was a paraplegic. Ah. He couldn't walk on his own. Right. He needed to be with a cane or a wheelchair. Uh huh. And so to actually see him younger, to see him slim, and to see him walking and telling me, you're going to be okay, he said to me. Wow. Don't you worry. It, for me, that was a blessing. Yeah, I betcha. But at the time, I thought it was a dream. Right. That would be a blessing. That's what I hope to share with people, is that their loved ones can still come through and give them messages. And they also sort of give them a little direction as to where their future is going. And with this show, it's the idea that we can actually see the different possibilities of who did what, but who done it? I love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's just great. So, are are there any things that we haven't discussed this evening that you'd like to discuss? Well, I think that we should work a little bit on your intuitive gift, and maybe one time I find something that you actually have to feel your way through the ether and see if you can make the connection. <laughs> well, I'm certainly game to try that, Darcy. But I've, as I've said before, I'm pretty dull on this stuff but I really am game so I'd love for you to do that that would be a lot of fun and I hope you're enthusiastic and ready to keep on going on the show for the next year absolutely superb I, I cannot see anything keeping me away unless you phoned and said hey we're done <laughs> well I'm not going to say that I'm hopefully going to say hey got another cool show for you and a, a topic that I've always wanted to talk to you about because there are Still, many, many topics, um, events, unsolved mysteries that swirl around in my head. And I think this is something I've got to talk to Darcy about. And I, I really look forward to every time we have our conversation. Well, I do too, because I never know what you're going to throw at me. And it's <laughs> like, do I get to bat it out of the field or am I going to have to take a you're out, sort of, you know, three strikes, <laughs> you're out, lady. Well, as far as I recall, you've never had three strikes and you're out. You've always batted home runs on every episode, and it's just so cool. And I want to thank you for your participation and your enthusiasm and for sharing with me and our audience, you know, your special gifts, because as you say, not everybody is willing to look at them fairly. Not everybody will give you an, an honest break. And you're, you're risking yourself when you open yourself up to us. And I, I do greatly appreciate it because I think you've got the coolest talents and it's been a blast uh, getting to know you this past year. Well, I'm also going to thank you because if you hadn't taken a risk 
uh, this show never would have happened, and the fact that you're willing to do all the research. All I have to do is look at pictures. Um, without that portion of your gift, you know, we wouldn't be here, and I look forward to the fact that you're going to dig up something juicy for us to do again in a month. Well, I will be, so let's, uh, we'll be seeing more dead people in the future. Okay, well, I look forward to it. Yeah, me too. Thanks, Dars. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, thank you, Nicola. <sighs> We hope you've enjoyed listening to Seeing Dead People. Whatever's going on in Darcy's head, I think is so cool and astonishing. We'd love to hear from you with questions for Darcy about her psychic process or suggestions for other mystifying situations you would like us to investigate. So please shoot us an email to info at radiosydney.ca with Seeing Dead People in the subject line. New episodes of Seeing Dead People will emerge on the first Saturday of every month and will also be available every Saturday night at 8 p.m. and Sunday morning at 10 a.m., both Pacific Standard Time. Seeing Dead People will also be available as a downloadable podcast online at radiosydney.ca for your convenience. Cool news! Seeing Dead People is now a podcast on YouTube. Just search for Nicola Furlong Mysteries, and you will find three podcasts of videos dedicated to seeing dead people. One for our actual complete episodes, another for Darcy's fascinating answers to our listeners' questions about her psychic process, and a third with teasers highlighting each episode. Thanks so much for listening to Seeing Dead People. I really dig researching, writing, and communicating with Darcy and her otherworldly contacts. So until the next time, remember, Seeing Dead People is a blast with goosebumps guaranteed. This has been a program of Radio Sydney.